I need it's back on. And I have my recording back. Now let's just hope that um, restarting was able to resolve the problem. So I'm going to put my PowerPoint back on and then I'm back in my explanations. Here. Okay, and uh, this is where I will get started. So, oh, is that, is, I hope that the streaming is all right. And uh, see that uh, so far, all good. Okay, so now I promise that I will explain why is that we are so keen to do real time simulation. Well, this is partly related to LUT organization. And uh, this need, I need to explain this to you. Um, some uh, six years ago, six years back, roughly that time, we got the new president, new rector to university. And usually how, what, how it happens is that you get the new president or rector, then you, what follows is a new organization. And that exactly what happened in LUT as well. But this time it was a little bit of a different story because the rector at the time wanted to organize the university such that it consists of three schools that I'm sure you're familiar with. Those are Lutz School of Business and Management, Lutz School of Energy System that we are, you know, part of it, and then the Lutz School of Engineering Science. But in addition to these three schools, she wanted to organize something that is called research platforms to encourage internal cooperation between the different schools. And there was, a, of course, you know, the call that the, all the professors and the researchers were able to make the proposals. And that's what I did as well with a bunch of other professors. And we made a proposal that, you know, something called SIM platform would be something beneficial to university. And it, that proposal was accepted. And now what the SIM platform is actually doing it is trying to take a simulator driven design technologies to next level. And it is doing that by emphasizing the real time simulation and make sure of the industry 4.0. And uh, you know that the, how the industry steps, how they went. The 1.0 was uh, you know, mechanical structures, you know, water power, steam power, you know, that very basic thing that happened like a million years back. Then the second industry 2.0 was a mass production that in, at that time was very important innovation assembly line, electricity too was involved. And the industry 3.0 was a computer and animation uh, and automation. And now the, what we are looking at the moment is related to cyber physics system and that's industry 4.0. And that's your life. So, uh, not making any sense to learn about the steam power any longer but really what you need to know is the cyber physics systems and this is what this class was about you know how to capture the dynamics associated with the different machines and that's what the simulation or the sim platform is doing and it is actually focusing on something that is called digital twins and there's a you know that's a little bit of a difficult concept because it really depends on who you ask what that means. I'm sure that right now all this is pretty much unclear to you, but I hope that you know, understanding the big day that virtual presentation all comes clear once I'm able to close my presentation. And really the big picture is not just to use this in a one product process, which is typically a product development, but use this in a design, manufacturing, selling, marketing, training, operation, service, all these product processes, and it's possible with the current technology. So, this is a little bit about the introduction. And to get a better idea, let's look at the animation, excuse me, video about the digital twin. This Manufacturing machines can be a complex and costly process. Assembling the first prototype from parts that haven't been developed or tested together will often cause problems, and getting everything to function properly may require significant amounts of materials and effort. Nobody wants to be known as the manufacturer of poor and unreliable machinery. So wouldn't it be great if you could build your first prototype, securing the knowledge that it already has hours of thorough testing behind it? Well then, may we introduce you to Mavea. 
Mavea combines all plans for your machine into a single virtual model called Digital Twin. This includes all the components necessary to build your machine, such as the interface to the real control system. The Digital Twin that is created is a virtual physics-based representation of your machine, capable of simulating its behavior and use in real time. The Mavea software simulates real-life physics, so the machine can be tested in different environments and on the actual tasks that it's designed for. You will be able to detect potential problems before anything is even built. The digital twin can be inspected and modified when necessary, and stakeholders can also get involved in the development process at an earlier stage. The rapid development iterations that the digital twin enables will result in fewer prototypes, reduced costs, and faster lead times. Moreover, Mavea's solutions allow operators to use the simulation for training, which means they will be qualified to use the machine before it even exists. The digital twin lives and evolves throughout the life cycle of the product. Once connected, the digital twin can analyze the machine's use and behavior in the field and provide vital feedback. This data can also be used to develop the prod products. Read more about Mavea Digital Twin on our website. So again, how, what, what is this Mavea? That's a university spin-off that is located at the, at the business park next to university. But what is that we can learn from that? Again, you know, I wanted to emphasize that, you know, they concept can be applied, which is they and our concept too, can be applied to wide variety of product processes. So from the plan all the way to operation in service. So that's uh, what we believe that is something quite important. And all that because of the real-time simulation. So here's an example how the real-time simulation look like. So this is an excavator model you can find in a sim studio that is uh, located in a university corridor. So it consists of mechanical parts that you know how to model. It consists of hydraulic models, you know how to model them to you. And the deformable prompt model, which you do not know how to model. But other than that, you have all the knowledge in order to understand how it is that one can build the simulation model describing an, an excavator. And that's very nonlinear structure. That's something that with any other approaches would be super painful to do, but with help of the techniques you learn from this course, is all doable. Now, these are the examples. This is, by the way, the, how it looks in a Unity environment. I mentioned about the visualization. So the visualization that is currently being used is associated to Unity. And you know that, let's just watch this and then I will explain some more. That's done. So in game industry, there are two platforms that are very frequently used. The one is Unity, and uh, the, the animation you just saw is based on Unity visualization. Unity is actually able to offer own dynamic engine too, but we believe here in the university and in the Mavea too that uh, the engine that is based on Unity engine is not physics based enough because you know some of the things are cut it short a bit and we would like to do things in a proper way to make sure that you know everything is according to reality and that's everything meaning all the components that is affecting the performance of machine dynamics including the actuators and mechanical components another platform that is often used too is unreal engine and let me see if i have an example about no i don't have that example about unreal engine but again you know, what we wanted to do is that we wanted to combine this knowledge we learned from this course. So mechanical models, actuators, 
control system we did not discuss and then the user comes in a play if able to solve these other boxes such the way that the solution is synchronized in real time so actually the trick that is needed is not so significant because everything explaining the mechanics actuators and control system you have to build the equation of motion for that and then you're just synchronizing the solution time to real time and you read in the signal that this that the user is able to produce and that come from the joystick or whatever is the means how the machine is controlled now sometimes you hear these stories that real time is a waste of time referring to the fact that the real time simulation is a waste of time because they said that it is not physics space it's game it's game and you know that the game is for kids not for real hardcore engineers and we don't believe so we don't believe so because here is a of course a half of the story only but this is a measurements and the real time simulation that are compared against each other and what this is representing actually is an operator and it's of an excavator and each one of these cycles here is a one work cycle so there is a number of work cycles and yes it is true that the curves are not matching 100 percent but they're capable to represent things accurately enough such that you can actually make a conclusion based on machine performance using just real time simulation okay so now ready to move on to product process examples by the way what is that we're going to do today um i know that it's uh three um, so we are kind of like supposed to have a break this time do you need a break or just, can we just continue and then if we continue i will just uh, explain this story and then the summary story and then you're free then i will let you go back to, to nature right okay good okay so product processes examples so here are the few examples and i think some of them are interesting so this is a list of product processes we have where we have used the real-time simulation and of course you know everything gets started from the product development but even in a product development that is listed here first it's possible to account something that is previously very difficult and that is related to customer direct feedback why this is important i will explain that to you in a, in a second also it makes it possible to build the simple games where the user can modify the product and then by monitoring how is it the user is actually doing that we can learn what is a customer's desire understanding what exactly they would like the product to be and then of course we can do hardware and more importantly software testing you know the current machine consists of huge amount of software which is a uh, hard to test if using real products but with help of the real time simulation we can mimic the behavior of the real machine and then test how the software behaves in different environment and different conditions safety studies too are simple and pleasant to carry out with using simulation in the marketing user training customer value analysis which is not actually my field of expertise but is the business people that are participating in the same platform they're looking at how the cast customer value can be analyzed with help of real-time simulation and the product showcasing you know product can be um, tuned for individual needs like a passenger car is a good example you can select the color you can select the engine transmission line interior and so on and so forth and you can do that today using a, a web browser and once you're done with your selection then what comes out is a price and the picture of your car but you know with this help of the real-time simulation you can even go and try how it feels like and you can compare that against the different settings without you know doing the real uh, test drive of the actual car and this is being tested already in a several mobile machines and i will explain a few examples a bit later service business default diagnosis embedded models for maintenance 
it is all through service, all that is possible. And then something that is very interesting that is the end of my presentation shows how an artificial intelligence is combined with real time simulation. And actually it's combined to something that is faster than a real time simulation. So those are the four different subjects where um, real time simulation is, is used. But now let's get started from the product uh, develop. Here comes a very, the first thing that we believe that is very important. And uh, it seems that there is a trend that uh, um, the focus is moving away from technical aspects and beginning to emphasize something that is a user experience. And you can learn that in a many different, but there's a lot of examples that tells this is exactly what seems to be happening. Um, well, electronics for customers like phones is a good example. You know, no one really cares about what kind of uh, processor you have inside of your phone or what kind of battery you have there. Nobody is willing to learn the details related to those technical aspects because no one cares. What they really wanted to know is uh, what is an expected user experience. So is it this is an iPhone and you know how I think that the user experience is in my iPhone versus user experience with something else. That's what really matters. And the same kind of trend is seems to happening to other products as well. Um, passing to cars is another example. Seems that less and less emphasis is put in the technical specs, and more and more is put into how is expected user experience. And even you know just a minor detail is that when you read in the magazines that are comparing the car cars against each other. Typically they're using statements like this feels solid or this feels this and that. Feels this and that. You know, us as a mechanical engineer, feelings, you know, no way. They are not getting together. So feelings for sure is not our strongest sort. So how is that we can understand those feelings? So if it is all about the feelings, you know, should we go to another school, leave this mechanical engineering and just go to learn the psychology or something? No, 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 we shouldn't. But we can use a real time simulation to learn these feelings. And that's what, you know, is a big advantage of the real time simulation comparing original product develop. And here I have, a, you know, this is a reason that we have in terms of product development. Uh, you know, the purpose of the product development, I'm kind of cutting the corners, but in my mind, the purpose of the product development is to serve customers, trying to place the customers. And how that goes at the moment, so if this is a customer and this is a product development, well, it's going in uh, using interviews and, you know, sending out those questionnaires, asking people to fill up the questionnaires and try to learn their desire based on that often is very, very difficult because customers may have a hard time to express their desires and what they want te using technical terms. And that's why it is a bit hard to understand what exactly the customers are, what the, how they would like the, the product to be. And now, once the product development kind of have an idea that this is you know, roughly what the customer would like to have, then they are using these digital tools there are financial method, CFD, multi-body dynamics, so on and so forth, in order to speed up the product development process. But really the main question is, are we making these decisions such the way that we're pleasing the customers? Not necessarily. And you know, rough statement is that you know, these digital tools helps us to make wrong decisions faster because they speed up the product development process, but are they helping us to make the right kind of products? And that's very hard. And we believe that we can take these digital tools, not all of them, but real-time simulation, and we can build the bridge between the product development and customers. And how that goes then, it goes such the way that the new products are launched with help of real-time simulation to customers and asking if this is what they would like to have 
another way around, the customer have a certain level of ways to modify the products to tell the product development, this is what we would like to have. And this is all possible because if you're able to use a machine or a product, then you can use a real-time simulation. You don't need any technical skills to make it happen. So that's why we kind of see that this is now helping to make you know, product development faster and more importantly, hit the target to do exactly what the customers are <coughs> desiring to have. Okay, so here's an example. This is a kind of a not so thorough example, but here's an example about the gamification, how we can learn a little bit about the, what exactly the customers are, would like to have. So here's an excavator and we would like, we build a simple game environment, you know, with the goal, which is a moving dirt or crown to this industrial hopper. Are we measuring the time? And the user can modify the, the excavator by selecting the different pocket and the selecting different hydraulic cylinder. And then you just go and we learn how is it they selecting the different options. And based on that, we can see uh, how they would like the hydraulics to be. So that's because customers, they can operate the excavator and then we can introduce a different kind of models and learn what is a customer's desire. Okay, the next user training. Well, this is a very conventional way to use a real-time simulation. And here's an animation which I would like to share with you because not because it's so outstanding animation, but because this is an animation that was built already or well, this model was built already 17 years ago. And uh, this is just telling you that this capability of real-time simulation being out there already quite long time. And of course, this is a quite simple, somewhat linear system, which is not involving that serious non-linear this, but still this was the first model that was built in a university capable to solve things in real time. And of course, when you look at now this you know, cable models, viral models are not very good. Collision models are not so great, but still this was able to do the job. And uh, actually, when you look at the literature, there was a book published already in 1994 that was stated as a real-time simulation of multi-body system dynamics in application of real-time simulation. 1994. 1994. So you don't remember that, I guess. So, uh, so that, and still things were able to solve in real time. What was the technique? Multi-body system dynamics, nothing else. Okay, so let's just, uh, I look at this, so it's a cane joystick, so it's not very sophisticated thing. And this is, uh, operator is my friend when he was a young guy. Okay, so let's see. Let's just close this and then move on after this animation. Oh, by the way, this is a motion platform, very heavy duty motion platform and not very nice visualization that was used to train operators of that crane. And that's actually physically was located in a close to Got Cup. I'm not sure if it is still there. That's how it looks uh, from that uh, user training environment. Here's a little bit of different kind of crane that uh, is more, way more non-linear than the, the previous one. This is the one that is uh, moving these boxes from the uh, harbor to, to ship and uh, another way around, of course. Okay, but let me move on because um, there is still a quite a bit of uh, slides to cover. You know, this is an example that shows like how we can build a library of different kind of uh, faults. And why is the way to do that? Well, you know, we wanted to introduce different kind of faults in order to build a library <coughs> that can be then used to see if there is a signal coming from the field, you know, what exactly is a problem of machine? Because we're just simply comparing the signal against the library that is uh, pre-computed. This is a, mm, 
an example that is not so great because we are actually pregnant the hydraulic hoses. So it's a little extreme cases, but we can introduce uh, problems in uh, some of the details in hydraulic circuit. So look at that. So it's quite clear. So it's time. So it's um, not needing a big library to figure that out. But the concept is what we would like to introduce here. Here's what I already explained to you when I described about the kinematics. So this is a concept of virtual sensor. An idea, again, is to measure quantities that are simple to measure, use them as an input to our model, and then the model will figure out the forces that are hard to measure by using embedded technique. So this was the bicycle that I explained you earlier. So bicycle is running and we are estimating the forces that is imposed to front and real tire. And we do that with the embedded models by using and using the measurements of steering angle, forward velocity, and leaning angle. Okay, but now something uh, which I believe that is the most promising field, which is related to how to combine artificial intelligence and and efficient computing together. You know, this idea to do this combination was originally introduced in game technology. In game technology, there's, by the way, a lot that we can learn in uh, mechanical engineering. And the first videos that I would like to share with you are related to um, uh, game technology only. So this is uh, Berto Hamel, and he's a professor in all the university. And he's using the techniques where things are computed much faster than real time. Let me just, uh, let me go here and uh, explain first what it is. So if able to solve in real time, so it means that everything is synchronized to real world. But what it means if we're computing faster than real time? It kind of allows us have an, having an ability to see what happens in the future. Because we're going much, than, uh, much faster than real time, we can see Okay, this is what happens if we keep things as they are and, uh, you know, being able to see the future. Not really what's going to happen tomorrow, but, you know, in a short perspective, we can see what are the consequences. And now, if comparing really much faster than real time, then we can have a number of different motion scenarios, say, 100 different motion scenarios. Each one of them are protected to future with help of faster than real-time computing. So we can have non-promotion scenarios and we can see what are the consequences on each one of these cases. So then comes uh, artificial intelligence in a play and selecting the most desired motion and doing the action based on that. And again, well, then we're gonna do the action and then we're gonna protecting things again in the future, selecting the most desired one and protecting things in the future so it's almost like having ability to see the consequences. I kind of feel that, have you seen this uh, best movie ever? Terminator. You yeah? have? You know, that's a um, machine have this kind of like ability to see the consequences. Terminator. And I think this is, uh, must be the technology that they're using in the Terminator movie. That's what I'm thinking. Then somebody mentioned that the Terminator is not the real deal because, you know, in the original Terminator, they said that this uh, mass awareness takes a place, when was it? 2000 and was it 10? This is already history. So that never happened. But anyway, so that's, uh, you know, what is that then doing here in uh, predicted simulation and faster than real time. So let's look at that. So now it's, you know, first this is like Angry Birds game. You're shooting and then you see what happens. But what if you're able to compute much faster than in real time? You see what are the consequences. So you see them immediately. So, let's see. So these are the consequences. This is showing you how, what's gonna happen if you're gonna shoot it this way. This kind of killing that this game is making no sense anymore because of this much faster than in real time computing. But that's exactly the purpose here because you know, now we can uh, use this, not just in a game technology, but in other technologies as well. And this is what I'm gonna show a few examples where the 
physics-based efficient computing is combined with artificial intelligence. So let's just look at that. And let's look at another example, and then I will show you something else that is used also in uh, game technology. So here is a task that you need to cross the road, and the traffic is heavy, and it's not more, it's not working out so well. So it's uh, several collisions. And now you're using this ability to predict. So you're looking at these motion scenarios, you're protecting them in a future, and then you're selecting the most desired one. You were able to do it. Okay, so another example where this is being used is that there is a, let me take a look. Okay, this is a, you know, with the pre-teaching, um, well, this is not the same, not completely the same technology any longer, but it's uh, trying to make the human to walk, which is quite a challenging task. You know, the walking controlling is difficult. And I look at, you know, how it goes in the beginning. So it's uh, looked like, um, I don't know, for me it looked like a student of uh, technical university on, I don't know, Friday evening <laughs> after several years. And it's, uh, yeah, but now once the unit is using this technology, so it's stabilizing, it's getting better. Okay, so this is all about the game technology. Let, let me leave this, and let's, let me move to this. Here is uh, when this technology is applied to that text -aware. So. Uh, So it's still, uh, you know, standing every now and then, so it's thinking a little bit, but everything is automated. You know, what we are saying to, or what we are doing actually, is that we are saying to artificial intelligence that here are the controllers that are located in the capping of this excavator, go ahead and use the machine. And the purpose of this machine is to move dirt from ground to industrial hopper. Do it. And then it's trying to look at the different possibilities and um, it is able to do it. This is quite important because, you know, this is now operating environment that is not a constant environment because the environment is changing due to the operation of the machine. But that too we can capture by using this technology, this efficient computer. Okay, so. So, let me move on to conclusion because one more thing to cover today. That's a summary. Okay, so the conclusion is this. So we wanted to do the build this box that you are very, very much familiar with. So we wanted to cover this mechanical structure, actuators, control system, and synchronizing all that to real time to make it possible that the user comes in a play. Now the work, working process really depends on the application, but like it could be the deformable crown like was shown in that excavator case. Now, if you want to learn some more, there is a website here uh, which tells a little bit about the SIM platform. These are the sponsors, these are the other professors that are helping or doing the same vision. And let's, let's look at a few nice animations. L, you guess what? Correct, T. And then the final one, this is my, my all-time favorite, current director that is seriously lost. Okay, so uh, that's it. Now that was about the real-time simulation. Just so, uh, okay, uh, let me move back to that other presentation too. How is my streaming? Is it still, still looking solid? Not this. Where is it? This this one. So we were here. I did not ask any comments or questions. Because I'm yeah. Is there any? How you feel about this uh, artificial intelligence business? Do you like Terminator movie like I do? Yes? <laughs> okay, so. Here. Here is a summary. 
Okay, so first let people an opinion. I am sorry about this. I think that I need to turn this off. Some uh, funny things from the previous years. First thing is this. Look at the items that I'm expecting you to know prior to next midterm exam. List is short. I mean, like, short in a sense that, you know, embedded technique, which was the one that based on coordinate partition, that's the first thing. But look at the rating, three stars. So it's not so super important. So if you're in a hurry, skip that. And then the hydraulic modeling, which is obviously the main body. See the details. So each one of these topics are rated. I will explain how they are rated in a minute. And then the real-time simulation, which is more like, I don't know, watching a movie or another time. Or I don't think that you need to watch it another time. I think it's pretty much clear if you haven't been thinking too much about other matters during my present days. So, so four things only. And it's clear that the second midterm exam is easier than the first one. But don't take this in a wrong way. Don't take it as an up nose attitude. Yes, I'm a really good, I know everything, so I have, you know, can't do attitude without reading anything. It's not going to work out. You still need to work like no limit. Work like no limit. But still, you know, this is your opportunity to score high. And now if you say, again, hypothetically, you scored three from the first midterm exam. My experience is that, you know, those ones that are scoring three from the first midterm exam, they will get, um, so scoring three from the first midterm exam, they will get um, four from the second one. So that will give you four from the written part. Typical scenario is that simulation assignment is rated as a okay, making no effect to this number. But then if you have done uh, in-class quizzes, by the way, there seems that uh, some of the material is still missing from the in-class quizzes. We're gonna look at that a bit later this week. And if you have done the weekly assignments, then you will get um, 0 0.5, so it's going to be 4.5. And again, it will be rounded up. So it's going to be 5 out of 5. And think about this. 5 out of 5 is considered like an outstanding, like unexceptional, really, really high score. If you're scoring 3 out of 5 from these scores, I would consider that as a very good accomplishment. I would be very happy by myself. Why? Because look at the, what are the topics we've been discussing. Very, very difficult topics. So this is not the easy class. This is one of the most difficult classes you can find in a, at least in a department of mechanics. There's one course that is more difficult than this, but only one. That's uh, machine dynamics. But uh, other than that, it's just a downhill. Okay. What do you feel? Am I right about that machine dynamics? It's more difficult than this. Yes. It is. Yes. Because it's all about this modal, nodal. Soon you don't recognize what is what, so you get so confused. I heard that there were cases that no students were able to find out of the lecture. They were like really so confused that they were staying there all night. That's what I don't know if it's true or not. But. Uh, Okay, so but this is not so bad. So let's take a look. Embedded technique. Okay, what is an important thing to remember is from the embedded technique? Well, remember this thing that, you know, the cause of the virtual work for the constrained system cannot be said to be equal to the zero. And there are two ways to force this to be equal to the zero. The first approach, we will use the Lacran's multipliers to account the reaction force due to the constraints. Or alternatively, we express this virtual displacement such the way that is kinematically admissible, kinematically possible. But that's not an easy thing to do in a general case. But 
there's a trick to make that happen. And that trick was based on coordinate petition. How it goes? It goes such that you will select or you will categorize your generalized coordinates to be dependent and independent. You can, roughly speaking, you can do this selection as you want, but you need to make sure that the number of dependent generalized coordinates must, must be equal to the number of constraint equations. And the number of independent coordinates have to be equal to the number of degrees of freedom. In computer implementation, there is a Gaussian elimination with the uh, full B boring or column, it's going to be column B boring that will do it for you. But you don't need to worry about that, that this time. Anyway, so now once you have categorized your coordinates to these two categories, then you will accomplish that same for Jacobian matrix. And that helps you to express the virtual displacement of all the generalized coordinates by using just independent generalized coordinates. And now, if that's the case, this is following the degrees of freedom. So it's fulfilling the constraints. And now it's clear that the virtual displacement is kinematically admissible. So you substitute that information here, and then you can set this equation to be zero. That's the main message. Rest is a painful mathematics, which is a less important. So you can, uh, using several denotions, and with several of these denotions, you can express the equation of motion as it is shown here. Now, here is an important thing. You need to understand that when using the coordinate partitioning, you will have well, the number of differential equations here will be equal to the number of degrees of freedom. That's a big difference comparing the method based on Lacron's multipliers. You don't have reaction forces when you're using this embedded technique because you substitute in your constraint inside of your original equation, so you're losing that information. Okay, high blocks. Let's look at the details. Properties of fluids. So, rated as a four stars. So, it's important. And now, two things that you need to learn. So, not all the properties, but two things. Well, the first thing is a viscosity. Another one is about models. And now, if you wanted to select one, just one out of these two, it's clear, it's obvious, it has to be about models because that's the one that is then being used in, well, later when you're comparing the, the pressure inside of your hydraulic circuit. Now, how it then goes, the bulk models, it goes, you know, there was this example about two containers and how there was one fluid within these containers and how you can change the volume so the fluid will compress and the containers will expand. And with that, you can express your uh, bulk models, excuse me, effective bulk models as it is shown here. This is something that it's, I think it is the concept itself that it makes sense to, to understand that because there may be a question related to this concept. And again, rated as a four star, you know, this uh, viscosity is not even mentioned in my summary slides. It's still possible that it comes in the uh, exam. Very highly unlikely. Very, I would say that 100% certainty. There is a question related to long fluid theory. This is the one that allows you to compare the pressures in different location of your hydraulic circuit. So it goes such the way this whole concept goes such the way that you form the differential equation for volumes, and in these volumes you assume to press to be equally distributed, meaning that there is no pressure waves within that volume. And then there is a total which is separating these volumes, and the, that. Uh, makes it possible the flow to travel back and forth, try to compensate the pressure differences. This is to try to you know, make sure you understand this, and not just that, but this equation too. This is critical to memorize what are the components, what are the physical interpretations. And let me explain. So here's a B dot, and that's where you can compute the pressure. Here's the effect the bulk models, there's a volume of the 
planes of the hydraulic circuit you're looking at. This is a flow rating, flow rate out, and this is change, the volume change, which is only valid and only needed in the case of certain actuators such like hydraulic cylinder. So that's, that's, that's clearly the most important measures of the second part of this class. And then the flow types, look at this, rated as a three star. So what is that, medium importance? The yeah, medium importance. So, but look at the level of knowledge that I'm expecting you to know. So if you're dealing with the laminar flow, make sure you understand that then the flow rate and the pressure difference are linearly related. How they're linearly related, that of course depends on the case, but that can be defined by the CL to F percent. There were several different examples how that can be computed. Alternatively, there may be a turbulent flow, and in that case, the flow and the pressure difference are quadratically related. That's, again, important to memorize. Valve modeling, you know, that's good to look from the lecture notes and uh, from the slides. So two, two parts. First, you need to move, you need to compute the, where the moving part is uh, located at, and then you can compute the flow rate through your component. And we use a semi-empirical modeling approach in which we get started from analytical equation. And analytical equation are converted to be in a form that allows us to get unknown parameters from manufacturer's catalog. Here's an example, which is a throttle valve. The throttle valve analytical equation requires to know discharge coefficient and the diameter. So those parameters are all backed to one semi-empirical parameter, which is equal, so no accuracy is lost. And this is something that you can get from the manufacturer's catalog. Okay, then direction valve is first you have to estimate where the spool is located that you can do with help of first order differential equation. This, by the way, could be in the exam. What is a physical interpretation of this equation? The answer is spool position. And then once you once, then uh, hydraulic cylinder and the pump, you know, the, let me get the starting point from the cylinder. Cylinder is the one that is converting the pressure to be the mechanical force. And the information you need to know is a pressure and the corresponding cross section area here in the piston side and piston rod side and the friction which you can estimate using that a polynomial expansion. The pump is something where we are modeling the flow rate that is producing. That's important to keep in mind. Okay. Real-time simulation. Consider these different product processes. You can make a story of your own. So if you're not happy with my story, you can add something to that, or you can change the direction a bit and make it some nice story if there is anything asked regarding these things, which are the different product processes. Now, I only have one slide left. And that's uh, this one. So you need enough marketing. So you're fed up with my marketing actions. So for sure you're not gonna come to this course. Think about it, it's, uh, I think it is more fun. More fun than this course. I can guarantee you that. Okay, so that's my last slide. So with that, any comments, questions regarding the midterm exam, regarding life? So this, yeah, this is, I think, something good to know, learn is this. Respect. Anything else? Okay, so if not, I'm gonna close the streaming, I'm, cl I'm gonna close the recording, and uh, wish you all the best. Take it easy in the exam, take it easy in your studies. No, 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 don't take it easy, but pull, <laughs> with the full steam on here. You know, all your effort to that. Okay, all right. Thank you very much.